At The Ortho Show, we are proud to partner with Shoulder 360. Today's episode of The Ortho Show is sponsored by Shoulder 360. Shoulder 360, the conference, provides a comprehensive shoulder course focusing on shoulder repair and reconstructive surgery. Shoulder 360 will always continue to redefine the way we think about surgical education of the shoulder. They focus on new methods to engage attendees, encourage participation, and utilize new educational technologies for a more interactive experience. There is no death by PowerPoint here. Shoulder 360 aims to educate the spectrum of healthcare providers caring for patients with shoulder disorders. The target audience is practicing surgeons, surgeons in training, nurses, physician assistants, and physical therapists. Shoulder 360 wants participants to learn about the newest and best ways to treat their patients while enjoying a setting designed to foster lifelong friendships and collaboration. Trust me, the venue is awesome as well. Don't forget to use our promo, OrthoShow10. That's O-R-T-H-O-S-H-O-W-10. The numbers for your 10% discount when registering. Okay, here we are, Shoulder 360. We're just cranking out the most amazing shoulder surgeons here. We have Mark Frankel, who is literally one of the world's pioneers of the reverse, the reverse total shoulder, which is so commonplace. But literally in the 90s, when he first started the concept, it was rotten tomatoes and really pushing against industry and, and society and doctors to come up with a new uh, technique, which now has really become the standard of care for shoulder replacement in the United States. It's a remarkable story talking about his parents as Holocaust survivors as well and his passion to continue with education and medicine. It's a great episode. You're going to love it. Dr. Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro. From medical media, this is The Author Show. Hello world, Dr. Scott Sigmund, your favorite opioid-sparing orthopedic surgeon here for another episode of the Ortho Show podcast, where everyone knows we bring you the best of the best in orthopedics. We're still live down here at Shoulder 360 with some of the most renowned shoulder specialists from around the world sharing their ideas and concepts. We are really excited today to have Dr. Mark Frankel, who's an orthopedic uh, surgeon, shoulder specialist who's in private practice at the Florida Orthopedic Institute. He is literally one of the world's authorities on reverse shoulder replacement. Mark, what a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Scott. Ple- pleasure to be here. Yeah, fantastic. So usually on the ortho show, we always like to sort of start at the beginning. Tell us where you were born and how the idea of like orthopedics, your parents, if anybody was a doctor, all that kind of good stuff. Sure. Uh, well, my parents, uh, they were survivors of the Holocaust. So um, in 1943, they're in the Warsaw ghetto. And on the second night of Passover, they escaped underneath the sewers. Uh, they were the only two people that survived throughout that ordeal, and they had forged papers, and they made it to Vienna, and they came to the United States. They didn't speak any language, any English, and they uh, ended up in Chicago. I, I had two older brothers, and I, I bring up my parents because um, g- growing up uh, as a, a child of survivors, I was always amazed at the stories they told me of how they survived. Some were... Uh, at the time, I didn't quite realize how tragic they sounded because my parents were super optimistic. They really loved life. Um, they were very nurturing and supportive. And uh, from that, I think I had a really strong sense of resilience. Um, and I think that resilience sort of developed uh, a lot in how I deal with adversity because I had some values that were taught to me at a very young age about what it was to survive under circumstances that are truly unimaginable. Um, so I, I think that was a, an, an important aspect of when people say, well, how do you deal with adversity or whatever? I think back that in, in some of the most difficult times of my life, I've reflected back about how my parents did it. And th- they did it. And they did it and they didn't really have a hatred or anything it was really pretty startling to me of how much they loved life and and what they wanted us as uh, their children to perceive what life's about Uh, i can imagine it provided tremendous motivation for you as a young person to strive to be successful right the stories of your parents of them struggling to get here and then 
I'm sure, doing everything they could to raise their children, you felt obligated to perform and do well. Well, the irony is my mom became a psychotherapist, and, and she was somewhat a, an, of an academic, so one of the things she was interested in was what happens to children of survivors? So that was her first question. And as you pointed out, it's very common that children of parents who are survivors of these catastrophes, they, they tended to be super high achievers, although uh, some people told me you're not supposed to use that word, but um, you know, very professional and successful in the profession. My oldest brother's an ER doctor. He was the one who got me interested in medicine and in orthopedics. And my older brother was a lawyer. We had a makeshift family of a, another family, and they were doctors and lawyers. So clearly there was a unspoken uh, communication about being successful, particularly in things that required some scholarly work. You know, it's, it's, uh, as a Jewish American myself, I, I, I listen and I, I chuckle a little, but we didn't really have many choices growing up either. It was, you know, gonna, you know, you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. And that's just sort of, you know, the direction when many of our parents pushed us yeah. or at least encouraged us, I should say. Yeah. I didn't even know what an engineer was. I thought it was someone who I still not sure, but I have a better idea. My father was a chemical engineer from MIT. And so you, you know, at least you knew about that. My yeah. dad sold furniture, so I had no, no knowledge, but um, you know, the, I think those, our, our values are so shaped by those experiences, yeah. and uh, I'm sure for you as well. Yeah, no, no, there's no question about that. And so, all right, so um, really a remarkable story. So how do we get to Iowa for, for college? So, uh, well, this is a little disappointing story. So I was looking at colleges, and I applied to Michigan, and I was a okay athlete, and I didn't do quite as well in my senior. I looked at Iowa, Middlebury, and then Grinnell. My cousins, both my cousins, the makeshift family, they both went to Grinnell. Um, I didn't. I got waitlisted in Michigan, and uh, the head of our clinical research, she she was a star at Michigan. So I always said, "Well, I, I couldn't quite get in," so it makes me humbled. Uh, but it, it was really uh, things about Grinnell. One, it's a very small liberal arts school. My cousins went there. It had a very strong academic uh, reputation. And it had this relationship with Rush Medical School that you can do, at that time, you could do your undergraduate at Grinnell, and you could do your first year of medical school at Grinnell. You get exposed to uh, more rural medicine. Um, so that made it an attractive option. Because I, I knew when I went to college, I wanted to go into medical school if I could get in. Yeah, I just got asked that question today. When did, when did you want to be an orthopedic surgeon? I was like in 10th grade when I screwed up my knee and I went and saw an orthopedic surgeon. I said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> For me, my oldest brother was an ER doc. So when I was 16, I was sort of a, not quite a very driven, not very have much direction. My brother was doing his internship at USC, and I went to visit him. He said, kid, you want to be a doctor because you get to help people. You always have a job. You'll be respected. He said, but, you know, you got to stop fooling around. you really got to start to work. So I'm like, okay, well, that sounds like a good idea. So I got into medical school, getting into medical school, and I was always into working out and the fitness type stuff. He goes, kid, you want to be an orthopedic surgeon? He goes, they're always really happy. He goes, but I'm going to tell you right now, you know, you got to be in the top of your class. I'm like, okay. So uh, he sort of, those simple things that he said, I just sort of took, well, that yeah. seems like a good idea. Yeah. Um, so that got me uh, into orthopedic surgery, quite honestly. So back to Chicago, rushed for medical school, uh, and then uh, and then residency down to South Florida. So that I got into med school. That you know, I, I applied a year early. I sent in one application to Rush, and by God, I got in. Awesome. So I got in a year early. So then at Rush, they had this thing called the post sophomore fellowship. It was a research fellowship that you had to be selected, and I elected and. I was awarded that, so I had a year between my second and third year of medical school where it was basically, you can do anything. And the premise was that most medical students really did not understand research. They they could read a research article, but they really didn't understand, well, how do you assess the quality of the methodology? Or how do you see if the methods and the results actually are supported in the conclusion statements? And so the, the goal of that was to try to encourage you to, to learn those skill sets. Um, so just a, an interesting aside, maybe. So during that year, I was always interested in bodybuilding. I had this year, and I, he's the person who ran it says, well, you can do whatever you want. So like, okay, 
I'm going to compete in the Mr. Chicago Land, which is so. It, there are these pictures of me circulating in Mr. Chicago Land. I, I took third, so I did not win it. But what happened is, in that process, I met a f- another guy who was competing, and he was in chiropractic school. And we were talking. I said, "What about anabolic steroids?" So this is 1981 or around that time, and uh, he says, "Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know." Like, I said, "Well, I'm doing this research fellowship. I got access to all the medical literature." So I go to Rush, I went to U of I, there was nothing. There were these articles that said it didn't work, there was no benefit, there was no, and clearly that was not what was happening. So my first research study was to look at the use of anabolic steroids in the Chicagoland area, and we published it in JAMA, first out of the gate. Oh, this research stuff's not that tough. <laughs> so that was an irony, but that sort of uh, got me more interested in the idea of research. And that year, I, I really got interested in looking at all different aspects of how you do uh, research. That was when AIDS was just starting. So there was a, a big push in understanding immunolo- immunology. And uh, so there was, you know, male predominance. So there was some thought that maybe there was some aspect of hormonal imbalance that would alter immune system. So I got interested in that thing. But I, that really got me wanting to be uh, more interested in being a clinician scientist. That year really changed my perception. So when I went to uh, Tampa, that's where I went, did my residency, um, the, the chairman there, a guy named Phil Spiegel, is from Chicago, is a super guy. He was like, well, what, you do whatever you want. And they didn't have anyone doing research, so I just started. I, I did a rat experiment. I looked at did rat, I did osteotomies in rats, and I did all sorts of different research as a resident, and they, they really had no one do it, but he was totally supportive of it. In fact, he was so supportive that he said, look, when you finish your residency, he had done a year of research in Davos in the research lab at the AO. And he said, Mark, you, you need to do this. This is something you'll really like. And, you know, as a fourth year, he actually sent me and my wife there to just make sure we liked it for two weeks, which I was taking every other night call, so I couldn't believe I was going to Switzerland. He's paying for it. I didn't have to take call. Uh, But it was a really great experience, and that got me to do that that year of research in Davos, which which is a funny thing. I did did this year of research, and it was really looking at osteosynthesis and animal models, and it was uh, fairly significant basic science. And I, I had a great time. We traveled all around Europe. And uh, I had already planned to do my next year fellowship at the Mayo Clinic uh, with uh, Dr. Moran Cofield, where that's where I did my adult reconstructive fellowship. So I knew that was next. And when I left Switzerland, I thought, well, this is a really fun year, but I don't think it's going to really help me career-wise. Which it, I, I laugh at that because, ironically, when we talk about what – sort of things that made me think about how I was going to innovate and develop a rear shoulder replacement. All that basic science about how bone grows into metal, um, it all became very clear to me of I now had a strong foundation of how I could approach this uh, with what I thought were scientific principles that would likely lead to a successful innovation. Yeah, so that foundation in and of itself, even though you weren't sure at the moment or the time, really led you to, to help, which we're going to talk about shortly, which is the concept of how the reverse shoulder replacement and innovating in that space. It's interesting. We just had Buddy Savoie and, you know, doing an AO fellowship was, was sort of very, you know, very vogue at that time, really, just to understand and learn from the best in trauma, from the people that created the system of trauma for bones. So really fascinating that you found a similar path, and and, uh, and for sure. And then, of course, going to the Mayo Clinic is where you honed your skills you know, in the arthroplasty with, with some of the greats within shoulder and elbow at the Mayo Clinic. Yeah, you know, when I was looking, so because I was going to Switzerland, and at that time, fellowships were very uncommon, um, I decided I had an interview, and I, I thought, you know, I want to work with people that are the key opinion leaders because I want to see what it is they do. And I wasn't really sure shoulder and elbow at the time. I liked shoulder and elbow, but I liked tumor. I liked sports. So I interviewed with a, a guy named Henry Mankin, who is the chairman of Harvard. I interviewed with Bert Zarens. I interviewed with Joe Lane. And then when I went to Mayo and I got the interview with uh, 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 Dr. Cofield and, and Dr. Morey, uh, I was like, oh, I can work with these two guys? This is awesome. And when I was going around there, Sean O'Driscoll was in the lab. 
he was working on the model of posterior ligament rotatory instability elbow. He's like, Mark, look at this. This is so cool. I'm like, wow, this is, this is the place I want to go. And I tell you, the Mayo Clinic is, is a very special place. Uh, Rochester, Minnesota, you know, it, it sort of uh, selects out people who are going to be there for things other than the glorious temperature or the, like Tampa's a zillion times nicer than Rochester. Uh, but it did provide me uh, what I thought was another aspect of a strong foundation in sort of a how I thought uh, I, values that were important to me to carry on whatever I did in the future. And, and of course, I mean, in our fellowship years, you know, that's some of the most important uh, sort of foundation for what we do later in life. So, you know, I want to talk about, um, so you, you all right, so from Rochester and the state bird, the mosquito, you've had enough of this. I'm going to go down to Florida where you've, you know, spent some time and set up practice. So when I was looking at jobs, um, I, I sort of knew I wanted to go back to Tampa. I loved the, the faculty there. And there was something really interesting that happened. So I, I knew I wanted to be an academic orthopedic surgeon. It was always what I wanted to do once I sort of got interested in, in that. Um, and uh, so my chief year at, uh, in Florida, uh, they fired my chairman, Dr. Spiegel, because they it was a political de- deal, right? And so what happened is, the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and University of Florida walked out in one day and formed the Florida Orthopedic Institute, which is a private practice. So you have all these academic orthopedic surgeons who left because they protested the firing of the chairman. It was They were done. And it's amazing that USF... It, it, anyway, um, so I knew I wanted to go back and join that group because I really liked them. Um, and... The, the people that were there, we all sort of had this feeling like we're going to demonstrate that the private practice group can actually be productive as academic orthopedic surgeons. So you don't have to be in a, quote, university. So that was sort of the important mission. So when I came back to Tampa, uh, the group was very supportive of whatever initiatives I wanted to do. And the idea that I wanted to be a shoulder and elbow surgeon, that was very unique. But they're like, okay, um, right away, all my partners said, any shoulder replacement, going to go to Mark. So that was a big support. I wanted to do a, 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 a Tampa shoulder course. My, one of my other mentors, Roy Sanders, so Roy is the president of our group. He's the chairman of the department, which I'm actually a, a faculty member of. Roy, at a very young age, said, look, if you want to be famous, here's what you got to do. You got to publish. You got to be a world's expert at something. You got to publish like crazy. You need to have a course. You need to have a classification named after yourself. <laughs> and there was, uh, there was one more. I can't remember. So, I, I, and I, so I'm like, okay. So early on, I started having Tampa Shoulder Course, um, which was called Current Concepts or something. And, and part of it was I didn't really know how to do arthroscopic surgery. This is 1992, so it was very not early. Not done. Yeah. So I'm like, hmm, I can go visit people, but... Here I live in Tampa, so I had Buddy come, and I had Gary Gartsman come, and they taught me in a, a real way. So you're running a course, and I'm you're learning at the same time. Oh, it was, it was, it was, I did that course, and I still do it. It's not near as fun now because I knew what I needed to know, I thought, things I wanted to learn, things I didn't know how to do or complications I needed help with. Um, so, so I started that, and, and early on my practice was pretty busy. busy. I was... Uh, I, st- I did general orthopedic surgery, you know, with hip and knee and that sort of thing. But quickly, I started to, you know, be do much more shoulder. And, and what happened was, you know, the patients that had a, a deficient rotator cuff, those patients uh, really, they had no good answer. And I tried every conceivable surgery to help them, and they all pretty well failed. And I had several people that had that I had done a hemiarthroplasty, which was what I was trained to do, that actually got substantially worse after the surgery. And so those people, like, they were begging me to come up with an answer. So, so in 1997, Tonier was going to launch their anatomic shoulder in the United States, and they were looking for surgeon champions. So I was identified by them. So they are like, look, we're going to send you over to fly to France, and you can meet the two designers this guy Boulot and Walsh, and I never heard of him. Like, okay, whatever. So I, I flew over there, and those guys are just unbelievable. I mean, we would operate all day, and they were master technicians. And at the end, 
we would go out to dinner and, you know, I would just hammer them. I had a tape recorder and for hours I would pummel them with questions. And uh, it was more Gilles than I was like, look, what about, I got these patients. He said, oh, there's this crazy guy who's doing this thing. Because he, he had started doing it a, a couple years before I went there, a reverse shoulder, and he was talking about Cremont. He said, I don't really know what, how it works. So I'm like, okay, this sounds like a pretty good way to think about this. Now, the irony is, so the International for, Conference for Shoulder Surgery was earlier that year, I think, timing-wise, and the, the, there was several presentations by Bao Lo, who is Grimaud's fellow, and they had these videos showing these people. And I remember walking out with a contingent of American shoulder elbow surgeons. They're like, look, you can't believe any of this European stuff. I'm like, what? I mean, that looks like a, a solution to a problem that I can't have. So those things made me want to innovate and come up with that answer because I, these patients really begged me for some solution. I felt obligated because I did this surgery that made them worse. Yeah. So, so you're with the French royalty, uh, which is, you know, recognized by yourself and you go over there and you spend incredible time with them. You're seeing that you're having a real problem with patients that don't have rotator cuffs with the current solution for shoulder replacement, perhaps they're getting worse. And I really, you know, harken back, I've, I've done probably 150 of these interviews now and have really developed a true understanding of the history of orthopedics. In the 90s, were such a pivotal time in shoulder, right? We're learning how to do arthroscopic shoulder surgery. Uh, there's these new concepts coming over from Europe with this thing called a reverse total shoulder. And I remember the earliest results, and in comes Mark Frankel and says, well, no, I think it's the way we should go, and I think this is an operation that we should be doing. And innovation in the setting of, of uh, it requires great courage to go against the mainstream and the concepts of what other people are thinking. Well, you know, I think if you think about your life in uh, sort of those circles where we're at meetings and you're getting shelled by all these colleagues, about your radical thoughts, um, yeah. But if you think about that most of your life is spent in your practice with your patients, then they become the metric of how you can assess how you're doing. And all I needed to see, I, I, there were several people early on that it was like, oh, my God, this freaking works. And, and you didn't, it didn't have an answer. You did not yeah, have an answer before I, this. Yeah, and, and it, it, was, it was so – I have a, a, a video in one of these talks I give. Uh, I think it was one I did in 1997. It was a lady who had the Warland bipolar. Her, when she tried to bring her, her arm up, you know, her humor had escaped and was almost touching her ear. I mean, it was so dramatic. And I revised her to a reverse – and she could get her arm to 90 degrees, and I just couldn't believe it. I mean, that was so, like, to me, it's like, oh, my God, this patient, there was no solution for her. And I, I gave her a solution that really just didn't exist. So those type of successes were so stimulating. They were so, uh, you know, and, and again, you know, I had a group of people around me that were sort of, you know, I was really into research, and I was trying to collect patient data. So they were, we were videoing all these people, and, and early on, I realized no one was going to believe the outcomes. They just weren't. So we started videoing every patient before surgery and after surgery, and we videoed a lot of the surgicals. So I have surgeries from 2000, right, from 23 years ago. I have their pre-op, their inter-op video, and their post-op video. And, you know, you, it's, it tells the story. And, and I did it because I was pretty well convinced. First of all, the results were, frankly, hard to believe. They were that phenomenal. Now, we had failures. I mean, the failures were there. I mean, the, so, the, so when I left France, Gilles said to me, first, this conversation with Gilles started, he was telling me about the latter And he tells me he's done like a zillion of these. I'm like, Gilles, you need to publish this. This is in 1997. It's a they're never going to publish this. Uh, this is too against it. So then, like, oh, well, I, I don't agree with that. But then he said, Rivers, because it's never going to be in the United States because the American surgeons will never do it. Now, I didn't know that Near was a 
a strength, he was a really strong opponent against it. He had tried it in the 70s and it worked, and he had this uh, like mandate, like this is, should never be done. And I didn't know Nier. I didn't know anyone who trained with Nier. So I wasn't really influenced by that. I didn't really recognize it. But in the background, I was really wanting to show Jill that I was going to try to lead this charge because I believed that this was a technology that would help people uh, tremendously. So it's 2002. I now have my first series. I'm presenting it at the Academy as a poster, I'll say. Because trying to get stuff presented at the Academy was not easy for me. Um, but it was a poster. So now I'm really excited. I'm hoping Jill's going to come by, look at my poster, so I can sort of say, look, Jill, look, I really followed through on this. So he looks at it and he goes, oh, Mark, they're all going to fail because I had a lateralized center of rotation. And I didn't quite realize it when I was designing that. Um, you know, there were some, my uh, fellow uh, at that time in the, in the late 90s was a guy named Mark Mile, who's my partner, who has uh, really helped me tremendously. Mark spent recording in progress. Got all the articles, and they talked about these notching things. So I'm like, oh, well, we'll just move it over. So I, Jill tells me that. And at that point, I really don't think I had a failure. But I came back from the academy, and I see my first base plate failure. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to be a, Like, I just kept thinking this is going to be a disaster. I, I did not see this coming. But, you know, again, there were these successes. So I was able to sort of try to look at why they failed. Now, when I showed the failures to some of the traditional biomechanical engineers, they all said, oh, well, this is because of lateral center rotation. But it really didn't mesh with me because there were too many people that were doing really, really well. So I was like, I don't know if I believe that. I had one patient, um, he was a lieutenant in the Army, who was, he required uh, his Canadian crutches to walk, right? I did a reverse on this guy. Six weeks, the guy's using his Canadian crutches, and he did unbelievable. And I'm thinking, if, if it truly is a lateral center rotation, there's no way this would have not failed. Um, so that gave me... The, the, the sort of the desire to try to understand, well, is, can I identify why they failed? And that sort of started us down this looking at that. And we learned quite a bit about what led that to fail. And we were able to make modifications. And the really were unbelievably good thing that happened. So when I was doing these, so I did like 250 um, custom implants, which ended up being illegal. And me getting a warning from the FDA, but I was unaware of that. Um, but what, what that allowed me to do is it allowed me to understand the f- failures of this well before it was going to be released to anyone else. And so that really, I thought, was uh, it turned out to be great because I could then work through this. And there were several other things that we realized that we were, as we were innovating and we were seeing failures, how we can adopt our, our designs to mitigate the failures. And then we can mechanically validate whether or not these changes were going to work. And, and often they did. And to me, that's still sort of how I look at things. I look at the problem. I try to see if I can understand what it is and how I might try to either have surgical technique or uh, innovation in prosthetic or implant design to help me solve the problem. You know, it's interesting. I think the pendulum has really swung to evidence-based medicine. If you talk to all the young kids coming out, you know, let's do an RCT here, let's do an RCT there. I think it's really hard to practice medicine based on randomized control trials, level one ed- evidence. And I think that a lot of the greatness and in innovation has to come from experience and for your eyeballs to be able to treat patients, see the results, see what works, see what doesn't work, and then be able to innovate, tinker, change, move, and then eventually come up with a solution. And if you look at it right now, you know, what was in 1997, you know, this crazy operation that everybody was throwing rotten tomatoes at you for now, 75% of the shoulder replacements in the United States are now reverse shoulder replacements. I mean, it's really pretty remarkable. Well, you know, a, a, a couple a couple things. The first thing is dealing with the FDA. So with the FDA, the first thing is, uh, was to try to get it approved. So we went through this 510K process, and after a year they said, nope, it's not going to cut it, um, and uh, you have to do an IDE. So in writing the IDE protocol, they actually suggested we do a randomized controlled study 
with the bipolar. And we said, well, we can't do that because some of the patients that are failing are these bipolars. So, but that took a lot, uh, just in terms of the randomized control uh, trial aspect. The other thing is, so from the year 2000 and 2001, so 22 years ago, there was one surgeon in one center, and I did 100 reverse shoulder replacements that year. So this year, in 2023, it's estimated there'll be 120,000 reverse shoulder replacements done in the United States by thousands of surgeons in thousands of centers. So when I think about that, I'm like, wow, that was really an extraordinarily shift. And, and it, it has been. And it, it is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to see that. And I think we are realizing that we can use this technology to help solve a lot of problems. I think we will find that the technology will lend itself to other problems that require us to innovate new solutions. And I, I'm sure that we will. I remember one of the things that used to just aggravate me was when people say, well, what are you going to do when the reverse fails? Like, well, what do you think we're going to do? What do you think you'd, we do when every other operation we do fails? We have to innovate to come up with a solution. It doesn't mean we can't. It just means we'll be faced with that challenge and we'll sort through because that's what we need to do. That's, that's actually what our role in taking care of patients is. Very few doctors truly want to move into the space of innovation because it's challenging, it's, it's difficult, it's, it's fraught with failure, uh, and the ability to you know, have the courage to persevere and keep moving. So I think that's why you know, the, the Rogers Curve, for example, the chasm of innovation, right, when you get to become the standard of care, it just takes a long time to get there. Yeah, you know, I, I have some disagreement. I think every orthopedic surgeon likes to innovate. You know, there's that cliche, uh, show an orthopedic surgeon how to do an operation. The first time he does it, he modifies it, right? Because I think most orthopedic surgeons inherently are sort of innovative. When they're doing surgery, they try to adapt how they do the surgery to sort of meet their own skill or whatever they think might be more efficient or effective. And, and I think that happens. So I think the innovative part is, is not the part. I think it is the part is trying to solve a problem and realizing that if you're going to try to solve a problem, you, you have to go through a lot of different stages of failure. And, and you might not even realize that you've gone down that pathway. You know, when we do research, the biggest lie is, oh, this would be a simple project. There is none. But you have to tell yourself that lie to get started. And once you get started, and now you're investing your time in, into whatever project you're doing, you start to figure out how to get to the next step because you're, you're already committed in a way. Um, now, you know, I think there are so many problems for us uh, in terms of how we take care of patients, how we take care of ourselves, how do we... I mean, there's so many different challenges we have, and I, I still think the real money, so to speak, is, is, is asking the question. If you can ask the right question, then, then I think that's worth a lot. And I think it's often that we don't, we might come up with an innovative solution, but we don't really ask the questions. And it, I think if you do, it'll be more fulfilling and, and probably be more rewarding in the long run. What's your current innovation project right now? So it's funny, you introduce yourself as the opioid free. So, um, so I, I've had my hip replaced, my shoulders replaced, I'm going to have my other hip replaced soon. But what happened is my wife's a hypnotist. So five years ago, before I had my left shoulder or my right shoulder replaced, she says, "Listen, why don't you try? There's this uh, hypnotic uh, video that uh, you listen to it. It's 18 minutes a day, uh, a, a day, you know, every day, a week before your surgery. It's supposed to help with your pain." So, okay, I got to this. So I did that. I had my surgery, and I didn't have to take Tylenol. It was unbelievable. It was so. What do I do? I'm a shoulder surgeon, and what do I do most? I do shoulder replacement. I'm like, well, this is really curious. I wonder if this is replicable. So we did our first pilot study, which was a randomized prospective study. One group got the hypnotic recording. The other group got standard of care. Results were dramatic. But, like, well, there were some issues with the study design. I could go through it. it, it there were things we learned from the pilot about recruitment, retention, all sorts of things. So now... 
we're about 60 people. We need 80 to finish the study. Where It's a randomized, double-blinded study. One group gets a hypnotic video, 18 minutes long. The other one gets a relaxation recording, 18 minutes long. They're blinded. I'm blinded. And we, we have various different metrics. And that'll be really interesting because, to me, that is astounding, right? You think about something that costs no money, has no complications, that might substantially reduce the need for opioids after major orthopedic surgery. I mean, to me, that's transformational. Now, I have some reservations that even if our data is solid, that there'll be skepticism because that whole area is... But to me, it's really interesting. It's an interesting project. Um, and um, you know, those are the things that, you know, you find some question like, wow, that like for me, it was so unbelievable. And I was like, I don't know, maybe it's because of my, my wife and I'm, you know, I want to please her. I, I mean, I, I'm skeptical. I was like, I don't know if this is. Well, you're, you're used to skepticism. Yeah. <laughs> you're okay so, with that. So that, that, so that's my, one of my current research projects. All right. So we got to think here. One of the, one of the topics later on is going to be shoulder surgeons that have had shoulder surgery. Yeah. So we got to know if it's okay, yeah. what, what's your replacement? What, and, and who did it for you? So Dr. Cofield uh, did my left So I, so first I'll say I had my hip, total hip done 20 years ago. So I was in my early 40s. And uh, my partner did it. And uh, he was, he, he has, uh, I, you know, I, when I talk to people about surgery, I go through all the risks and complications. He's like, Mark, this is going to be like a blip. Like that was a, that was a pre-op counseling. And he was right. Um, and it was a metal on metal to lip, which turns out so far I'm 20 years and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, so then... 18 years ago, I, my left shoulder was killing me, and I'm at a Paris meeting, and I'm like, Bob, I, I want you to do my shoulder. He's like, all right, whatever. So he did that, um, and that was a much better surgery. It, I still, like the hip, I needed six weeks of pain medicine. It was sort of, I had to use a walker. Shoulder, a week's worth of pain medicine. I, was, I had to limit myself for about six weeks. And then, you know, uh, five years ago, on my right shoulder, it was dramatically better. Uh, and my partner, Mark Mile, did my right one. He was my fellow. He was the, he was the fellow that talked France. And just a quick thing about Mark. So, so we're doing this IDE study, right? We finally get it approved. And when you do an IDE study, the FDA has the ability to come and do site visits. So they come do a site visit. Now, because it was an IDE study, I cannot be the PI because I was the inventor. So Mark was my new partner. He was my fellow, and he did the military... He's in the Navy and had to do his obligation, comes back and joins me. So he's like in practice for like a year and a half. So now he's the PI, right? Principal so, investigator for our for listeners. For the FDA. Yep. So, so now I get this letter from the FDA, which is, you know, basically, you know, you cease and desist, you, you screwed up. But Mark got the letter too because he was the PI. And, you know, that... We both, he laughs about it like it's a good thing this worked out because we could have been in jail together. <laughs> um, and I, don't, I can't remember, like, because Mark is so even keeled that, um, that, that he probably just like, okay, we'll deal with this. Because I think he was seeing the same outcomes. And it was sort of a, you know, you sort of felt like, why is the federal government getting in our face with something that clearly is going to transform what we do? So I, I think that might have helped, but um, it definitely was harrowing, and, and he was a, is a great partner still. All right, so I think our, our listeners are going to want to know, as one of the pioneers of reverse total shoulder, what implant are you using at this point, and, and tell us about that. Well, you know, the reverse I use is the same one I designed. I would um, say that the base plate, uh, which is the screw-in base plate, that has not changed uh, since 1998. It's, it has P2 coating, but it had HA coating, but it's, just, it's exactly the same. We did make a change in 2003 when we noticed that the peripheral, uh, non the peripheral screws that did not lock had a higher incidence of failure, so we added threading. So since 2003, so 20 years, that base plate is unchanged, and it continues to what I use. I find it really easy to use, reproducible, and can allow me to do any problem. What's the name of the prosthesis, the it's manufacturer? The, it's, Innova, it's Innovis, which was previously DJO, which was previous Encore, but it's now called Innovis. Um, so that's, that's what I use, and um, we've innovated a little bit. 
On the humeral side, uh, uh, since then, we have different sizes. We've innovated on the glenospheres. We have more glenospheres, and we're going to continue. There's continued product development. Well, that's wonderful. You know, look, Mark, I, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule here to come and share your very unique story with our listeners. You know, from the story of your, your parents as survivors of the Holocaust to your passion and perseverance and innovation for creating an operation which seems almost sort of every day now at the time, uh, really not so much. And as a pioneer of reverse total shoulder replacement, I've truly enjoyed your story today. Well, Scott, thank you. I, I Again, I really enjoyed sharing with you. And uh, again, I sort of feel bad about talking too much about myself, but it's a pretty good story. It really is. And it was a pleasure to share it. This is Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro, host of the Ortho Show. Till next time.